All right. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you had a lovely lunch. The music was so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm joining you from Own Sound and it's the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations, the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people. I am Sowetmek or Simca First Nations, physically located in the central interior of BC, just north of Kamloops. And it's a great, great pleasure to welcome you to the much anticipated keynote address. I'm so excited to hear what uh, Nika has to say. So now it is my great honor to introduce Gong Nika Collison, Executive Director and Curator of Saving Things House or Haida Gwaii Museum. Um, and I just for a little bit, I've been so impressed looking up all the wonderful things that Nika has been up to. Um, she consults, she publishes, she lectures internationally. We're so happy that she was able to find time to join us today. Her recent publications include the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook published in 2019. Nika is also a traditional singer and dancer and weaver and she's of the Eagle Clan. Nika, please uh, start your presentation for us. That was so much, Petal. It's, it's so nice to meet you. Um, okay. Kuljak Ganga, Kilslai Ganga, Haidegat La Asis, the Langwa Duhan Gasl Kilt La, Hawa Agonquin, Ontario Lana Guit da Katlhada Gas, Staudigi dan Gasl Kilt Laga, a sing Zoom Ga. Hawa Ontario Museums Association at Indigenous Collections Working Group Wagena Singh, Canadian Museum of History, Canadian Museums Association, Mary Collier, and Petal Furness. Jiskang Hanudi Kigaga, Nika Collison Yats Haidaga Kiski, Di Haidaga Wagen Di Kayas Lanas Jas Jinaga, Gaslai Hanudi Lana Auga Kigaga, Saslinda Nai Di Stangul Haga. A high at the good and night la good still gat at the lung sting the lung wad luhan scoutiki gothel kilt la anga so koyada highborn woman highborn men good people thank you for being here thank you to the algonquin people for having us all on your lands through zoom thank you to the ontario museums association indigenous collections working group canadian museum of history Canadian Museums Association, and to you, Petal and Mary. My name is Jiskang Nika Collison in English. I am Haida from the Kayathlanis Joth clan. Gothlai is my town mother or chief. I work at the Haida Gwaii Museum and today I feel really good. Hawa, so much for you all being here. It is precious to me. Today we're doing the keynote a little different. Today there is a surprise. There are four of us. We work together at South Lindenai and we want to share what we do together. Anga it koyada. It is precious to us. So we will introduce my colleagues just in a bit and uh, I will just begin. As museum professionals and as human beings, we carry the responsibility to affect societal change by mainstreaming Canada's dark history with Indigenous peoples while actively working to set things right. In the Haida Museum realm, the path towards conciliation has been shaped by Yakudangang, the act of paying respect. The Haida Nation sees this work, more commonly known as repatriation, as based upon mutual respect, cooperation and trust. Yakudangang is how hundreds of our ancestors have been brought home. It is why our belongings held in global museums are visited and brought back to life. It is how South Linda and I, Saving Things House, the Haida Gwaii Museum came into being. It is what our own collection of treasures is built upon. Yakudangang has brought a new depth to the Haida Nation's healing and our ability to heal with others. It provides opportunity for Western museums to become voluntary agents of change rather than physical evidence of Canada's biological and cultural genocides against First Peoples. It can result in long-standing mutually beneficial relationships between nations and institutions and cherished friendships between people on the ground. 
Yakudangang challenges us to stick around even when we think our work is done because colonization is still alive. It's still alive and well. So what are we going to do about it? Decolonization is not quick, easy, or pretty. It is complicated, powerful, and transformative. It is more than repatriation. It is a way of life. Saflind and I, the Haida Gwaii Museum, is one of the earliest acts of reconciliation in Canadian history. It was created with the intention of making things right. Two worlds coming together for the betterment of all. A vision of both Haida citizens and Canadians residing on Haida Gwaii. The museum opened in 1976 in Kayong Sea Lion Town, an ancient village spanning back to the time of supernaturals and the originating town of my lineage, the Kayathlanis. This is where we came out of the ocean. Since almost all Haida cultural treasures left the islands during the height of colonization, we did not have much of a collection to begin with. But we've grown since to include a considerable collection of ethnological, archaeological, archaeological and archival treasures. Some arrived by repatriation, most by donation by our allies and friends, some by purchase and others by way of long-term loan. We also print, present new works as we are a living culture. In 2008, our museum tripled in size with the creation of the Haida Heritage Centre at Kayong Nagai. Conceptualized and driven by the community of Skidigit, the Haida Heritage Center is a 50,000 square foot complex housing several cultural and education spaces and organizations in addition to the Haida Gwaii Museum. Comprised mainly of style, several stylized longhouses linked together, it's reminiscent of an ancient village. The center sits where land meets beach, looking out over the ocean, situated between ancient and modern Haida society. And amongst it all is Saflinganai, a grave house built to house ancestral remains unearthed during the construction of the heritage center. It also hold, serves as a holding place for ancestral remains awaiting reinternment, the ones that have been repatriated. Throughout the museum are galleries and exhibits, every experience, word, object, and image has been developed with the community so we can say what we want to say and how we want to say it. It's a slow process, the slides. There we go. In the early 1990s, the repatriation of ancestral remains became a primary focus of our people. From this focus, Yakudangang was formalized and the Haida Repatriation Committee was born. Together, our, our committee and museum are directed by our leaders to undertake repatriation on behalf of our nation. To date, over 500 of our ancestors have been brought home from museums and private individuals across North America and one from the United States. The photo you see here is from 2005 when we held an end of mourning ceremony for all known repatriation ancestors or for all known ancestors repatriated at that point in time. Our ancestors' well being has been our priority. We travel to museums to do the work of preparing them for their return trip home. While at museums, we take the time to visit and learn from our treasures and other containers of knowledge, such as archives. We bring the diaspora of our people's lives home through in imagery, audio recordings, collection notes, and the recreation of pieces, and through the physical, emotional, and spiritual connections that forever bind us. We bring our ancestors home. We try to bring some of our belongings home. We are privileged to learn from community knowledge holders who travel with us, who can speak further to these parts of our lives living elsewhere in the world. We are grateful to our ancestors. We are here today knowing who we are and what needs to be done because of them. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to my friend to talk about knowledge as kept by our oral historians. Welcome, Ai. And um, can you introduce yourself? Whoops, I'm gonna go there. Singa la, everybody. Good morning. My name is Ai. Um, my English name is Albert. I was born and raised on Hadguai. 
and I'm here to talk to you about um, oral historians and also my great uncle Nanking Ayuans, pictured here. Back in the day, our Kajigatas, the white haired people, would um, bring the smartest kid to a Kaiganga Ulnagai, a legend telling town during the winter months. And they would tell the stories to these smart kids. Each story they would tell for three days, three nights. And on the fourth night, it was up to the smart kid to tell the story back to the Kajigaras. And if they missed just one word, they would start that process over again. In the winter times, um, they, um, they didn't, there was no concept of time. They had nothing but time to teach these stories. <clears throat> My great uncle, Nanking Ayuans, he was the last known oral historian. Um, he learned stories from his father, Gitgit Blias, Henry Young. Nanking Ayuan said he was a kid and wanted to play with his friends when he was younger and had picked up on them, on the stories, but wasn't fully learning the stories at that time. It wasn't until later in life, uh, Nanking Ayuan sat down with his father and learned the stories. He also learned the, learned the stories from Real to Real that his father, Gitgit Glyas, recorded while, while my uncle was out fishing. And Nanking Ayuans would sit and listen to these stories over and over and over again until he could teach those stories himself. Some of the stories uncle told us were of our family origin stories, our crest stories. He also knew Kuyakagan stories, raven traveling stories. I got to spend some time with my great uncle Nanking Ayuans, transferring reel to reel to CD in the early 2000s. While we were listening to them, I'd pick out words and I'd ask Uncle James, I'd say, what is this? What is this? And he would tell me because we were just sitting there listening to these stories as they were being transferred to CD. And when I felt it wasn't the time to ask him, I would ask my nana, my grandmother, about the words that I heard in these stories because most of those stories were all in Haida. So I just wrote it down in my phonetic haida and I had to ask my nanai later what these meant and my nanai would also tell me. I later joined the language program that Young King Ayuans was part of and sadly I joined after my uncle had passed. So I ne never really got to sit with him anymore and learn more. But I learned from his recordings now we're done at ship and listen to them as I sit and do work, do my work here at the museum. I listen to them on repeat because it's our culture. It keeps us alive. They're in both in Haida and English. So I get to, so I can follow along uh, through the recordings from what I understand in the Haida. We aren't a dying 
culture like they thought we were going to be back in the day. We are alive and still thriving today. Our AI, um, I don't know why I got emotional, but um, I was just thinking, you know, you're my chin, I'm my grandfather, Bill Reed, he learned from your, your grandfather, Henry Young. And then over so much time, I was privileged to learn from both your nanai, Stana Jutskaga Higans, and your uncle, Nankingai Yuans. And today we both work at Saflinda Nai, the Haida Gwai Museum, and uh, I think it's beautiful. Like you say, it continues on. Aya, you're also an artist. Uh, you're a weaver. I'm wearing my precious, precious headdress that you wove. Uh, you're also a designer of jewelry. Um, I'm going to go to this next picture. Oh, how do I go back? There we go. There we go, that's the picture I wanted. Uh, in this photo, there's you standing there with your Lana Alka, your chief or clan mother, Wiganat. Wiganat's wearing the most beautiful robe and together you're both holding a giant copper. Could you tell me a bit about that? Yes, on this, on this day, December 23rd, 2019, I had completed my second Raven's Tail robe. It took me just a little over three months to complete it, uh, weaving on it every night uh, from anywhere from 7 p.m. till 11 at night, every night weaving. I had a deadline that I had set for myself and uh, I was able to do it in those three months. And that was the second robe I gave to my chief. My first robe I completed uh, December of 2015. And at our clan Christmas dinner, I gave it to him. It was danced by my niece. And then just under two years later, my robe burned in a fire. And when we finished burning it off, because it was salvaged a bit, um, I told my chief I will replace his robe. And so in this photo, that's the second robe that I wove for him. And he honored me by giving me that copper oh. we're both holding and also Another had a name. Uga Kilju Da Guda Dal, which means walking lightly with a big heart. Hawa ai ai, and you truly do. Um, for for our guests uh, in the hideaway, you gain your rank, your status, and your rights through the distribution of respect wealth and through reciprocity and what you shared with us right now is the most beautiful example of that hawa ang asul koyara it is precious to me next we'll move on to gityaki john young and Swan kwa agang oops now i'm going there we go uh, so Gityak E, Sean Young, and Skon Kwa Agang, James McGuire, both who work at the Haida Gwai Museum as well. And they're, they're here to talk about an ancient chest spanning back seven generations of chiefs of the Gagyals Haida Gai, or Gagyals Kigawai of Skidans. This is a photo of them in that village. And before we, can, we begin, can you both briefly introduce yourselves? How are? Get yet. On mute. That's a common thing on Zoom. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gidyaki. My English name is uh, Sean Young. I'm a member of the Gakyal's Kigawai uh, Raven Clan of Kuna, Delmagai, formerly known as Skidans. 
I'm currently the manager of collections and manager of archaeological collections at the Haida Gwaii Museum. Awa, stan kwa agang. Tinga it la, stan kwa agang hana de kigaga. James McGuire is my name. I am uh, also of the Gakiels Kigwe clan of Kuna or Skadans. Um, and I'm the collections assistant at, uh, at Sotland and I, Hardegai Museum. Hawa. So what we're going to talk to you about, as I said, was the moon and mountain goat chest. So in 2002 at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, a uh, delegation of about 30 Haida, we traveled there to bring home the remains of 48 of our relatives. We of course looked at collections while we were there in storage, our, our belongings, and we found this chest. The photo here is in 1901 in the village of Kuna or Skadans before it left uh, and traveled to New York. When we saw it in the New York Museum, we didn't have to ask for any catalog records. We read the crests presented on the chest and we knew it belonged to the Gagels Pigawai people, something that maybe collection records wouldn't have even carried. Fast forward to 2017, we negotiated a long-term -ter loan of this chest so it could come back to Haida Gwaii and participate in an historic two-day potlatch. The first day was to honor the late chief Gadansta Percy Williams of the Gagels Kigawai, also known as Gadans Raven Clan. The second day was to inaugurate Gujao, who succeeded his uncle, taking the name Gadansta and the responsibility of his people onto his chest. Sean, you're a member of this clan and you're the manager of collections at South Lindenai, our museum. This was an extraordinary time in our history and you were tasked with caring for the chest both inside and outside of the museum as a clansman and as a professional museum worker. What was it like to walk in two worlds? Oh, how uh, just gone. So the internet was a bit scratchy there at the end. That this uh, beautiful uh, test, which was graciously negotiated uh, to come home, uh, is very uh, personal in the beginning, very special uh, to me uh, personally, because my great Chennai, uh, George Young, uh, was, uh, he held Gdansta. He was chief of Kuna Yonagai, or Skidans for some time. I don't exactly know how long, but it was directly tied to his lineage. And I didn't know him too well. He passed away uh, when I was only a few years old. But that's my first initial link, other than being a clan uh, member of the Gakiels Kigawai, uh, but being directly tied to a previous chief that held the same name. The uniqueness of having uh, this beautiful uh, clan and family uh, pressure Project back home was a good test of bouncing between two worlds as a collections manager uh, at the Haida Gwaii Museum, as well as uh, following the uh, loan agreements uh, that were negotiated uh, with the American Museum of Natural History, as well as finding a balance uh, and bouncing back and forth between uh, the wishes of my clan, uh, the wishes of my elders, and the wishes of uh, Gujao, who was going to take uh, the title of Gdansta. At first, the negotiations uh, were set in place for the movements of this beautiful trust uh, from New York or Manhattan uh, to Haida Gwaii, uh, which Initially, I would say we're probably pretty problematic with how our Western uh, friends handle our cultural treasures, uh, which is by art courier, uh, which is also very uh, expensive. Uh, I think it was around $50,000 US to transport it on special couriers from New York to Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Now, while reaching Vancouver, we quickly realized that we do not have art couriers that handle objects such as this uh, to remote, beautiful communities such as Haida Gwaii. 
and it had to be negotiated that we would rent a U-Haul truck uh, and drive it from Vancouver to Prince Rupert, going through British Columbia and then hopping on Hecate Strait to Kyle Guy to the Haida Grand Museum. So that was going against the normal of negotiating an accommodation for the reality of what's going on on Haida Gwaii and British Columbia in general. And our director at the time was the driver and a stipulation was put that Samantha Anderson, who was one of the head conservators would accompany uh, the chest en route uh, to Haida Gwaii. This beautiful photo here is uh, typical of how stuff rolls up on Haida Gwaii. Uh, that the chest showed up the day before, literally the night before the potlatch, and we had to unpack it. It was in a custom crate, in two separate crates. Uh, so this was where we start, as we call, hydaizing uh, conservation and handling of uh, beautiful objects, where normally within institutions, there's many conservators, there's preparators, there's other specialists to handle. Uh, with their white gloves, uh, so to speak, to unpack and deal with it here. Uh, this is where we quickly went into our clan and our cultural uh, practices of clan members uh, unpacking uh, the object uh, within the museum and it's sitting in our oral history gallery, uh, being witnessed uh, by three supernatural beings, uh, Skulu Judd, Kalka Judd and Jilakund. It was unpacked uh, by myself, uh, James, and our cousin Ian Wood, uh, we're all clan, we're all Gakiel's Kigawai, so we were the ones unpacking it uh, in the museum and uh, looked at it. We did our condition reporting, which is required, uh, which is very normal, and instantly the negotiations were in there where uh, Gu Zhao uh, showed up and notice the green paints. I always remember this quite vividly. Uh, Peter Whiteley was also there, who was a curator, who came up from the Museum of Natural History as well. And the first thing Gu Zhao did was he poked the chest. He was curious about the green paint because there's mica infused in the green paint. And he did this quick little uh, jab at it, which in many forms of conservation, there's many heart attacks to be had. Uh, but to us, our clan and our people, it's a living object. It's part of our family. Uh, it was never meant to sit in storage or behind plexiglass. So it was being brought home and being brought, uh, reintroducing it to family and clan members uh, in general. And Guja was the first one literally to touch it. And negotiations were had instantly uh, because the memorial potlatch was the next day. Uh, and this is where it got a bit tricky uh, where it was a bit stressful uh, to uh, deal with bouncing between the two worlds of conservation and clan asks, was we had to package it up in the crates and put it in the vault. And then we had to uh, pack it out, load it in a truck, and then bring it to the hall and unpack it and put it together uh, for the potlatch. So it was just a lot of extra work. There was no whining involved, but it was just kind of uh, that was the normal process that they would like, and we were more than happy to accommodate it, but it was done by clan members, uh, is how it was handled. And when it came to be uh, presented uh, in uh, the potlatch, the very first day of the memorial potlatch, the simple discussion was about how it was going to be displayed. There was talks of a display case, which was quickly uh, nixed instantly. Uh, there was talks of uh, Cheskung and I sitting with the chest with stanchions in front uh, with our white gloves on to make sure no one was touching it. And that was told immediately mixed as well. Uh, that was going to be very disrespectful in one regard that we would have our backs turned to the hereditary chiefs and their families and their wives. Uh, we wanted to be displayed to the public. And it was quickly figured out that we will put it on a beautiful milled chunk of red cedar. And hardwood dollies were placed underneath this slab of red cedar. And here it is on that beautiful slab of cedar beside Gidansta uh, with beautiful cedar 
strategically placed to hide the wheels of the hardwood dolly or the hardwoods. Uh, and one thing that was quickly, uh, this worthy interpretation of this beautiful object was instantly uh, discussed was, it was always recorded as the mountain goat chest uh, by our friends at the AMNH in Manhattan, uh, which to our clan, the Gakyal's Kigawai, the moon is the highest crest, that is the chief's crest. And that's what's being presented here beside Kadansta. We had a quick discussion which was very obvious uh, that the mountain goat is beautiful. Uh, to any person who's not familiar, they would focus on the mountain goat. It was beautifully carved. It was sticking out very pronounced. But to the clan, it's the moon uh, is the one that would be standing out to us. That's the chief. So we had a simple discussion of presenting the moon first to the public and our friends uh, instantly from the AMH were going, were told us, no, no, it's the mountain goat chest. Shouldn't the mountain goat be presented first? So we had a clash of cultures instantly of one who's not familiar with our clan. Uh, we're interpreting it based on the visual art that they were seeing. And we educated them on, no, it's the moon. And that was the decision, quick decision made by the chief and the elders. And that was easy direction for me to take, uh, to spin it around uh, quite happily to show the moon uh, to the public uh, instantly. And it was the same process after the memorial potlatch of uh, repackaging it up. We had to bring it back to the museum and store it in the vault. So it was just kind of a lot of extra work uh, for all of us to handle. And during the Gedansta taking his name and getting dressed the second day of the potlatch. Uh, we were going to use it for gift giving, uh, which was negotiated with the AMNH uh, conservator uh, in the museum where Ed, very sneakily, it's very awesome, uh, by my, my chief, uh, that he would have a couple coppers uh, placed within the chest. Uh, we were asked to bring the coppers to the museum and do a quick sizing. Uh, they fit perfectly. Uh, it was asked to put in some foam uh, just in case it doesn't impact uh, the chest. Um, uh, my clan was very sneaky uh, during the potlatch. Uh, I was quickly distracted to do something, I think, with the food during the potlatch. And my clan brothers uh, placed uh, at least 25 coppers within the chest, uh, which yeah. is quite heavy, solid copper. Uh, weighed, uh, I would say, uh, probably around 300 pounds, uh, give or take. And we proceeded to gift coppers, uh, just on behalf of our chief, Gidansta, to the chiefs and guests uh, to witness the potlatch. And we were told it was uh, uh, Ian Wood and I were uh, tasked with our taking the coppers out of the chest and Guja was, uh, our Gdansta was whispering to us to act like we were digging very deep and to take our time, which we didn't want to do at all. We're on display in front of 700 people uh, that we tried to do it as quickly as possible. But Guja, Gdansta uh, made sure that we took our time and we individually took one out at a time. And that was the gift giving that was done. And it showed a good testimony to the craftsmanship to this uh, 160 plus year old uh, chest uh, that was made out of yellow cedar and red cedar. Uh, that, that weight that the coppers had did not affect the structural integrity of this beautiful chest. And it was you know, brought back to life, it was reused. Uh, and now the story continues uh, with the chest. So it was a good, learning curve and a good uh, serious test of bouncing between a conservator world and uh, museum practices, as well as cultural or Haida culture asks uh, for these objects. It definitely aged me a bit, I imagine, because it was a bit stressful over those two days. And in the final, uh, the end of after the potlatch within a loan agreement, the staff members of, oh, there we are, gift giving. Uh, right here, here's the final phase the next day after the potlatch, which was early in the morning. And as you know, potlatches last a long time. They're going to at least 
two in the morning ish. So we weren't getting back to the museum till around three in the morning. The loan stipulation here where it's put in the glass case was uh, staff from the AMNH had to witness it being placed into the case. And we quickly put it in there and it was an ask uh, that we show the mountain goat first. And the only clan member I could grab at the time who was available was my brother. And we quickly picked it up uh, and put the moon first and put the last sheet of glass on top. So the moon was present as you walked into the museum. The moon was the first uh, 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 figure that you would see carved on the chest. And I, oh, am I muted or can you hear me? Good. Okay. How it yaki? And I want to apologize that the photos are out of order. Uh, we sent the the new order, but I don't think it wound up on the screen. So for you, I really apologize, and to our viewers. And um, I'm just going to go here because that was the slide. Just to show, you've got Gityak E there and uh, actually Skan Kwa Agang in the back and another clansman uh, and another clansman, Donnie, and he's presenting, he's holding up one of the coppers because one at a time they were given out. So hawa for that. Skan Kwa Agang, um, you were, you're of the clan, you are a budding artist, you are a ceremonial dancer and you were one of the people tasked with making a ton of coppers that were snuck into this chest. Um, what, what was it like for you to be a clansman, be tasked as well with um, the, the responsibilities you have to your clan and to have this ancient chest home? For me, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity, but uh, I always like to, as we talk about the systems, Sean touched on it, is to remind people that these items that are in museums and collections around the world are living, breathing pieces of our community and our families. And that chest uh, in, in, you know, in hundreds of years past would have, would have, would have been at, at forefront as a, as a, uh, a wealth holder in potlatch in many, it, in many different, you know, in, a, in, in our village at Kuna, in Skidans. And if you look back on notes from our village from people like Francis Poole, he notes 700 person potlatch is taking place in what, what they label as House 15. Uh, if you were to look on an archeological chart from that time and that Gidansta owned this chest, he had it filled with coppers and, 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 and robes and whatever, pieces of wealth that would have been given away to the witnesses at his potlatches and his history-making events. And then, and then uh, we go through a pretty hard time after that in that good dance does lifetime in, in Kuna, where uh, 80 to 90% of our population passed away very quickly. And uh, we were also implemented, the, also the potlatch ban and, and Indian Act was implemented where making these sorts of ceremonies illegal. And then that's when that chest left our, our, our place, but uh, it's always been part of our, our community. And so the opportunity to, as that chest arrived back to have, to take part in another passing down of, of the name Gidansta in an unbroken chain since the person that had it made uh, and used it at Watlatch is the opportunity to, to give breathe life back into that item and remind it that it's as much part of us as we are a part of it. And, uh, and to fill it with coppers to be given away again, to show, show people the wealth of our clan, uh, that we are able to give away that sort of thing. And we appreciate their witnessing, uh, giving power to our wealth. So it was, uh, it was an incredible opportunity for sure. And you were, um, we were chatting the other day about, about how a copper absorbs what's going on and, and it's a storyteller itself. Did you want to expand on that? I think there's a photo in here of the potlatch, uh, or maybe there isn't, but our clan has, a, has an older copper that has witnessed our history for you know, many years and been sitting forefront at, at, at potlatches. And 
if any of you have ever attended a, a West Coast potlatch and seen a copper on display or see, you know, you might see some of some of these photos, see some coppers on display. What those are, are they, they're not just a, a copper, you know, that it's, it almost has nothing to do with the metal. Uh, and it's, it's more a, a reflector or a window into the supernatural realm where our, our, the supernaturals of our clan and our ancestors can witness our history through that window. And as we look at it, we look at these coppers, we can read them like a storybook talking about all of the history that they have witnessed over time. And our clan being lucky enough to have a copper from, uh, you know, that dates back quite, quite a good, good ways, we thought it was important to, to make coppers and gift them out to other clans uh, in, our, in our communities, in the Haida community and beyond, to make sure that they could name their coppers and potlatch their coppers and give them names and breathe life into them and allow, and allow them to witness their own history so that they can be passed down to generations. And so that was the idea of filling, uh, the, that was why we filled the, the chest with those coppers and gave them away. Uh, it was, uh, we were reaching into that chest, into the past, into the history, uh, into a supernatural realm and pulling out copper after 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 copper, after copper, after copper uh, in order to give that wealth out to other, other clans so that they could practice the same history. Um, and you know, we're sorry that we, uh, we're sorry that we put added so much stress to you and Sean <laughs> as, as we snuck them in, as snuck them in. But we were confident in our ancestors' craftsmanship, and um, and uh, it made for a spectacle that you know, as the people witnessed that sort of history being given away, that that witnessing that story, the strength of a spotlight, the greater and more. Uh, as they say, extra it is, the further the ripple effect goes out into the world. And, you know, now as we tell the stories of these potlatches, just like people in the old days would have witnessed potlatches and gone back to their communities, they go back and spread that history of the great chief Kedansta and the Gakyals Kigoi people and their ability to give away wealth in, you know, that, 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 that ripples away. And, and, and we hope that you would, you know, come back and, and trade with us in the future. And that's the, that's the whole idea about, uh, about potlatching and witnessing is to send that, to give away uh, wealth, give away all the wealth that you've, you've accumulated so the story of your wealth ripples into, into the entire world. And, and our, you know, clearly that's, that's a, a good example of what's happening today. How was on Kwa Agang? Whoops. Uh, <laughs> So here in this image here, we can see you. You're an attendant to Nankilslas. He who voice is obeyed. He is the cultural hero of the coast, otherwise known as Raven. So you are a ceremonial dancer. This uh, You are making sure Raven is okay and, and you know, uh, does not misstep. A uh, little while later in the doing, um, you also danced uh, other pieces uh, in the upper left, right. You're dancing a mat or mountain goat, the, one of the crests of your clan and on the chest. And in the lower right, you're dancing Kalgajat, ice woman, who uh, led our people way down south uh, during the ice age, those who didn't have places in refugia, and later led us back. And in the doing, we were dancing Kalgajat to honor uh, the late Gdansta's uh, wife, uh, Verna Williams, who is also named Halgajat, so a name that has lasted around 30,000 years. But what I want to ask you about is Kalgajat and, and Nangpilslas are contemporary pieces. They live in our museum. We take them out for ceremony regularly. We don't put up signs saying, sorry for any convenience. We say, out for ceremony. What does this mean to you to be able to continue on in this way? It speaks to the example that we're trying to set with our collection here is that, is that our collection is a living collection and everything here uh, is to be used in ceremony when appropriate. Um, and so using those masks, they're not meant, they were never carved and meant to sit on a wall and when you take them off the wall, there's handles inside for dancing and that's what they're for. And so it's so that these, even these newer um, artifacts of ours can 
absorb that history and we can, as we're doing right now, look at that mask of Kagajad, A, tell the story of Kagajad and her guiding our people to safety away from uh, glacial times. B, we can go out and tell that story using this mask it, to potlatches, it, in potlatches and ceremony around. And all of that history that that mask witnesses can now be absorbed into it and spoken about as we, as we walk through our collection. Even just this, our, we had a copper trading ceremony behind me and this is a, a pole behind me from my father's clan, the Stostas Eagles in Skidigit. And as we had our copper ceremony, we had it right in where I'm sitting, uh, trading and returning a copper that used to sit with this pole as it was standing in Skidigit and got Gilda. Uh, you know, this pole was raised in the 1880s and fell the year I was born. And so uh, as it, the clan that we traded the copper to, to get the copper back to the original clan was able to have that ceremony in front of their last standing pole in Skidigit. So think about the power of that and, and, the, and the connections and through lines that we're drawing in history by having our people able to use these old items and give power back to them and then even have their new, newer contemporary items stored in our, in, our, uh, in our museum and put on display to tell those the modern stories. So uh, it, you know, it's an incredible honor to be part of that and, and to help facilitate those the, the power because those stories and understanding our history is what will keep us grounded in the hideaways and, uh, and help us move forward stronger together as people. How was so much gone, Kwa Agang? Um, you also, you and I, I actually were the couriers that drove with another American Museum of Natural History employee, Gabrielle, from Haida Gwaii to Vancouver. And, and you guys had a lot of fun and, and Hawa um, to, to you for, for taking, both of you for taking, well, no, I'm mad at you for taking it back to Vancouver. I'm just kidding. Hawa for taking such good care of it. Uh, exactly. And you know, <laughs> Sean mentioned earlier, you know, these, these are things aren't meant to be behind glass, but um, we do live in a modern world and we wanted uh, this chest to be able to stay on Haida Gwaii for a while and, and the New York Museum was happy to do that. So it did live in our museum with the supernatural beings uh, that, that Gityaki mentioned earlier and had it in a in an all glass case with the as Gityak E mentioned earlier with the moon greeting people, and then the mountain goat on the other side. I'd like to say this whole project cost us over two hundred thousand dollars us alone, and New York was able to contribute some uh, towards the cost as well. Uh, why it cost over two hundred thousand actually is um, oh now we better there. Uh, we also now the greatest part of the cost, two thirds of the cost at least, was to bring this chest home and to have it participate. And then um, we uh, right now are, are not in a position with New York uh, to bring, thing, bring our belongings home, but we will be and we have a good relationship with them. In the meantime, we commissioned Gidansta's sons and uh, they brought in his nephew to recreate the chest in modern form. And we presented it on the wall, all four panels during an exhibition on Yahgudangang to pay respect the repatriation journey of the Haida nation. I want to say that these are, this is an incredible story and we have others as well. Um, in 2000, we went to the Canadian Museum of History to bring home 148 of our ancestors. And at that time, we found this Bentwood box drum on the far left. And it had been collected from Kaisun, my clan's territory, of which Yaki's father is Gothlai, my chief. And it, this, uh, the other side of the box had a skull pin, but this side that you see is a mamachga. Now that is not one of our clan's crests, the Kayathlanis, but it is one of our sub, sub uh, lineages crest. And those people had died out after the smallpox. So when we found this Bentwood box drum, we played it in Ottawa when we received our ancestors back. When we brought our ancestors home, we also brought the, hum, the, the drum home for 13 years. And in that time, when the old goth lie passed away, and our clan hosted his memorial. The next day, Sean's dad, 
Lonnie took on the name and the responsibility of Goth Lai. And we played this bo Bentwood box drum, Guja played this Bentwood box drum for us and sang one of our clan's songs as we took this crest as one of our own to keep it alive because we're still here. And so we now have uh, use it. And I just wanted to show this photo because this is me with my Gao Jiao. And this is my clan sister with her Gao Jiao drum. And one of our crests is the skull pin, which I mentioned was on the other side of our ancient box drum. And I am playing the Mama Chigai. So in, in wrapping things up, there's a practice in our culture called putting a string on it. And, and in the old days, it could be that um, in the time of arranged marriages, the family of one young child might uh, endow a great amount of wealth to another, effectively putting a string on their child so that one day the two children would join together and live out life together. And I like to think that our ancestors put a string on their treasures and themselves binding us to something that transcends the preservation of Haida history, culture, and identity, binding two worlds so that we would come together in the future when the time was right to heal and to redefine our relationships with each other and with the world so we can move forward together. How about the Lung Wadlugan? The Lung Wadlugan Sao the Lung Wadlugan Kaida. It gooding at La Gutsluga Anga Fukoyada, Hawa, Hawa to you all, you are all great. It is precious to us. Well, thank you so much. Hawa, are people hearing me? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, Hawa, so much to all four of you. Um, it is precious to us as well. Um, my hairs on my arm have been prickling for your whole presentation. I've just appreciated it so much. I've just loved how you talked about you're actively trying to set things right. I also think a lot of people are shocked to learn that the repatriation committee was begun because of the act of getting your ancestor remains home. And that is shocking to me that different First Nations, their ancestor remains are still in museums all around the world. Um, I also know as a museum professional that we talk about if objects could speak and here we can see an object like this beautiful trunk in this big museum with all these people with great education but they can't hear it speaking. The only person that can hear it and listen to that spirit are the people it, where it's home and now you've been able to tell that story and it just seems ridiculous that that museum would be saying oh no that's not how it can be displayed oh no that's not how it can be named um i also think it's really important all of you have talked about that all of these things aren't just objects that they're living things and that they're being brought back to life and i think someone said breathing life into it and I remember back in the 90s, the archaeologists with Parks Canada were trying to get the Haida to save all the poles that were falling over, mortuary poles, totem poles. And they were told, no, when a pole is made, it's, it's designed to fall over. And that concept is just so hard for non-Indigenous people to get. So um, I think you've shed a lot of really important information to um, the participants. I'm sure we'll hear it in our feedback. I'm sorry, we really don't have time for questions, but all the contact information is here and through Mary Collier if you need help for that. So people, if they feel like they need to follow up. Um, again, Hawa to all of you, I feel like you're doing an amazing job and your examples to the rest of us to follow. So Hawa, once again, Hi, hello again. Hello. Hello. Hello.